Uh, hi, hi, hello. Oh, recording now? No, I'm not recording. I'm just oh. doing sound check. I just want to see what it sounds like in here. Uh, say something. Something. Something else. Keep going. Uh, hi, welcome to Warp Taste Podcast. Yes, I changed the name for uh, legal reasons. Um, <laughs> I'm here today with Miguel. You might know him from Facebook as Small Dick Emo Boyfriend. <laughs> I said that right, right? Small Dick Emo BF. BF, yeah, yeah which, yeah, which just, who knows what BF stands for, you know, it stands for uh, beef fried. Yeah, yeah, you know, beef But, um, Miguel here also does DJing, you've DJed at Emo Nights, Warp, uh, Warp Night, right? Warp Night, yeah. Warp Night, which is totally on, uh, well, I'm point here, because that's what we, we like to do here, but, um, I just want to say, first and foremost, thanks, Miguel, for letting me crash here. <laughs> yeah, no worries. But, um second episode wanted just to do something real cool and i figure why not interview somebody from the local scene of arizona who does a lot of cool stuff but um first and foremost miguel introduce yourself like how long have you been into like emo music and stuff like that Fuck. well i was introduced to alternative scene at the ripe age of like seven eight eight years old really yeah uh, a lot of uh, my older cousins who were in high school at the time yeah we're already listening to bands like Green Day, The Offspring, you know, some 41. So I was hanging out with my friend or my cousin and his friends, and they just put me into that. That explains a lot because yeah. I noticed that your music taste lingers a lot around like pop punk. Yeah. And like for me, like as most people know, I'm more like a post hardcore screamo type guy. That's like I grew up with pop punk and stuff. Right. But, so your cousins got you into it. So what was it like? Like you were just watching like MTV with them, or they like burn you some CDs or what? A lot of CD burnings, a lot of uh, you know live DVDs that they had. Like remember the first one of the first gifts that my cousin gave me uh, was Lincoln Park's Live in Texas DVD. Oh nice, that's yeah. a good one. And I would I would watch that shit on repeat. Along with that, he also got me Offspring's Greatest Hits, who were Offspring was actually, I, that one. I always say, and I always say this, and I'll never change my mind, the Offspring were my first favorite band. Really? You know, uh, anything that, anything music I would like always compare it to, the Offspring, like, oh. you know, like, I could see, like, little hints here and there, like, you know, until this band is into the Offspring as well, this and that. That Greatest Hits album was really good, because it had a uh, Don't Repeat, and yeah. that Don't Repeat, which I thought was, like, a really, like, encapsulating Kind of song because offspring has like a good method of making their songs like most pop punk like you know hear it, it's all you know they, they can do sad and stuff but i feel like with offspring they had a way of like adding a gravity to it because they have songs about life death and like with don't repeat it was just like kind of like if that was their last album that would have been a great way of saying goodbye you know right. what i mean yeah definitely so, I, would, I would like to say that like you know the offspring just really I wouldn't really consider them sad pop punk. No. You know, like, Definitely Big not. 182 would be, you know, stuff like that. It's more like punk rock with real guest lyrics, I guess. Yeah. You know? Like real meaning behind the words they say. And yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, when you're telling somebody's girlfriend to get a job, you know, you, you gotta. You gotta. <laughs> it's right here. It's, it's right, right here. here. Yeah. It's, it's real. The real problems <laughs> people in the 90s dealt with is telling people's girlfriend to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, live in Texas, that would make, uh, so you were like seven, eight, so that you were like elementary school introducing yourself into this. Third grade. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, dang, a real one. But, uh, <laughs> oh, Jake. But, um, so I imagine where like your first show or festival was around that time or did it take some time before your parents were like yeah you can go it took some time yeah yeah it wasn't until uh 2010 uh same cousin yeah was like i'm gonna go to warp tour mm -hmm. a lot of artists that you like are gonna be there uh i bought a ticket for my brother he's not going yeah. give me the money it's your ticket nice and my mom said no <laughs> uh but it was a constant well, if your dad said yes, then I can't do anything about it. And he's taking you there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. It, I it, definitely remember that, just getting dropped off. I think 2005 was my first Warped Tour, so oh, yeah. I had a little pipe. 
I'm like five years older than you, so that makes sense. Yeah. But um, yeah, I definitely remember. Did you just get dropped off at Warped Tour? Pick you up here? No. <laughs> so my dad ended up giving my cousin uh, the money for the ticket, mm -hmm. and then the night before, I spent the night at my cousin's house, mm -hmm. uh, along with some of his friends, uh, and um, we all went together. Oh, nice. So yeah. it was like a little group gathering. Yeah. So did you guys? When you go to Warp Tour, and I know some people don't know what Warp Tour is, or they didn't get to experience it, but the thing about Warp Tour is there's like a bunch of stages, and everybody kind of has their own flavors. Did you and your friend group kind of stick together and go watch all the same bands, or did you guys kind of like split up, meet you here, meet me back here, please don't die in the heat? <laughs> uh, a little bit like the latter. Yeah. Uh, so... My cousin being super into pop punk, his friend being super into uh, metalcore, yeah. and me at the time I was heavily into post hardcore. Yeah. You know? um, so we all kind of just went our separate ways and just said, you know, keep your phone on you. Yeah. You know, this. You know, we gave each other schedules. You know, the, those of you who don't know, you know, the big balloon. You know. Front of Warped Tour. It's like a big inflatable billboard, basically, with all the set times of what every band plays. And what stage they have and all that stuff. So we said, this time we're, we're going to be here, and this time I'm going to be here, this time I'll be there, you know, got nothing to do, let's meet up, you know, this and that. Yeah. So that, that's basically my first Warped Tour. I would think we all met up at the end. Yeah. Uh, Arrest of the Barrel Ones was closing the night. It was a Pomona yeah. Fairplex. It was a Pokemon of Fairplex. So 2010, that would mean that like Christo was still in the band, right? Yeah. 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 So OG, OG. Iwabo. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I've interviewed uh, Michael. He was the bass player. Oh, right. Player right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice yeah. guy. He's, he's doing cool stuff now. He does uh, nerding out with Rickshaw. So if you ever, you miss I wrestled a bear once and you don't want to listen to Spirit Box or Imperial Lights, you can go check out Rickshaw. He's doing cool stuff on nerding out with Rickshaw. But did you see I wrestled a bear once play? Yeah. How was that? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. It's weird. It's, I, for a minute, I thought, that can't be them playing. They're doing crazy stuff on stage. Yeah. You know, the guitarist was like swinging his guitar like a hula hoop around his arm and shit like that. Yeah. He hit himself a couple times. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it was it was very cool. Uh, the crowd was heavily into it. Oh, yeah. Uh, not a lot of moshing or crowd surfing, but the uh, crowd, you can tell the crowd was still in. Like, just vibing. Yeah. Just vibing. Just feeling the vibe. Yeah, in like 2010, that would have been like right after their like first album or second album dropped. I think second album. Yeah. They had a couple of covers, yeah. Yeah, because they had the first EP, the first album. I think they, they did they do two albums with Chris? I can't remember. They did two albums with Chris, and then like the one on hiatus, and she just brought them out. Yeah. Don't quote me on this, because I don't really pay attention. No, because they, they had Krista, and then they brought in Courtney. Yeah. And I know they did. I want to say they did two albums with Cordy, two albums with Krista. I could be wrong. Fact check me. Go on the comment section. Tell me I'm an idiot and I'm wrong. Go for it. Do it. Please. <laughs> but um, other than I wrestled a bear once, who else did you see at the Warped Tour? Uh, the first band I saw was Haste the Day. It was... Uh, was that like the start of the day? 10 a.m.? Yeah. 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 People already watching and shit like that. It was insane. Yeah. Uh, it was shortly after they announced that they were no longer going to be together. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. so... Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. After that, uh, Of Mice and Men was on the lineup as well. I want to go see them. And it was just after they released their cover of the Lady Gaga song, Poker Face. Poker Face. Yeah. yeah. That was a solid cover. I saw them. They opened for, I want to say, Dance Kevin Dance. And, yeah, they were playing that. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a bad cover. It's not I a can't, bad I can't cover. knock that no, cover at all. Yeah. Because a lot of bands back then were doing, like, pop covers and, you know, a lot of it was hit and miss, but you know that was probably one of the better ones. That was definitely one of the better ones. I would oh, yeah. Like, so you saw Haste the Day first, so, so they were the starting band. Mm -hmm. Was the crowd for it good? Like, was there enough people there for their crowd? Yeah. I think one year the first band I saw was a Treyu, and it was a good sized crowd, and like it was like one of the first mosh pits that ever opened up around me. That was kind of crazy. I think the following year Armor for Sleep was opening, and they were sure. kind of disgruntled that mm -hmm. they were opening. You could tell. Because the crowd's kind of like it's early in the day, yeah, and you can you just you have the banter between sets, or it's like, are you guys up, huh? Like, yeah. Wake her up, like you know, and it's just like, I mean, I get it. Armor for Sleep is very high high energy music, but you know, 
it's sad boy stuff at 10 a.m. You know, everyone's just trying to buy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like you saw. Switches. Yeah. So you saw Haste of the Day of Mice and Men. Was there any other bands you saw that day? Uh, Confide. Nice. Were they playing um, Such Great Heights? They yeah. didn't. They didn't I, was, I was in the crowd. I was yelling it. They weren't doing it. Damn. They weren't doing it. I mean, they weren't happy happy about it. <laughs> yeah, they probably were. That's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. It's okay. Fights there. Um, Pierce the Veil. Nice. The lineup, uh, but it was uh, after Fellow of Dramatics came out. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, so it was after the first album. Yeah, yeah, a player for the dramatic yeah. was their first. That was like 2007, 2008. Yeah. That should have been around the time that Selfish Machines that had been out because they toured on a player for the dramatic for two years. Like, they were a band's band. They, they like everybody would just take them on tour, and they they were on like a two year cycle for player for the dramatic. So I think Selfish Machines came out like 2009, 2010. Yeah, would have been a fresh album. Yeah, so you would have like paraphernalia or some shit like that playing. Maybe. Possibly. Possibly, because I remember seeing them. But the crowd just wasn't. They, they didn't pull a good crowd at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was still early. It was still early. I think. Um, I think that Selfish Machines album was like the start of them, yeah, like when they, yeah. starting to kick off. But the next album with King for a Day and all that, you know, that's um, really what got them. Yeah, that's. I think that's day. what popped them off, and yeah. I think that it also comes with that, like with like Sleeping with Sirens was popping off too. Yeah. When you get bands collabing and doing guest vocals, you're gonna get like a really cool, like pop off scenario. Yeah, definitely. Because I think Pierce Savelle was also doing features for like a day to remember at the time. Or yeah, a day to remember was doing a feature on uh, Pierce Savelle. Yeah, I think that's how it went. But so you saw Pierce Savelle. Any other band? Alisana. Alisana? Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. stuff. They're always good live. They were my favorite band at the time. Yeah. So I was very excited yeah. to see them. Hell yeah, yeah, dude! Like, yeah, they would have been like uh, emptiness probably yeah. would. Yeah. Right like, after emptiness came out. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, they would have. They've been playing all the hits. He, he, oh yeah, they uh they opened up with the murderer. Of course. And they closed with apology. Nice. Yeah, between you know Ambrosia, the thespian. Yeah. Know, they got like a thirty thirty five minute set, so it wasn't a lot, but they played the hits. Seduction. Yeah. Uh, I love that song. Yeah. I, I like that song a lot. Seduction is such a good song. I think it's like one of their more underrated albums, uh, where myth fades to legend. I would say it's probably my favorite Alice Santa album. Yeah. yeah. I I feel like it definitely combined like. Their singer, uh, Sean, I believe it is. Yeah, he's definitely like got like a good pop singer voice. Yeah, and I feel like they embrace a lot more of their pop elements on that album, but they still like this is the part where you're supposed to scream or like that song like that it just has such a like awesome heavy breakdown like Absolutely. it was just I felt like they were really coming to their own, but a lot of people I think when the emptiness came out, I think that was like when people kind of recognized them as like true mainstay artists because that's a good concept album it is and they're yeah. like what it's a trilogy right? yeah yeah pretty they're like because yeah. I, I know it's honestly after uh or what's it called oh, the album after the emptiness i kind of just fell off of them yeah yeah i feel it you know it happens yeah. you know we, we 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 go towards different music we grow out or we, we return to our roots and start listening to different stuff I mean, I'll always throw on like an Alice on a track every oh, time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even if nobody likes it, it doesn't matter. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw that Alice on a. Was there any other band you saw that day? Um, never shot never. That's because they were next to the stage. I was waiting when I, before I wobble came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. He wasn't doing the Bohemian Rhapsody cover, was he? No. Oh. God, no. I don't know. I, I think God, I blacked out. No. <laughs> I think I blacked out out of sheer boredness during yeah. that set. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to have like Christopher Drew or whatever his name is like to attack. Hopefully me. he's doing well these yeah. days. Hopefully. Those yeah. pictures are scary. Do well. Um, <laughs> Please but, eat something. But no, I feel like there are bands like that. Yeah. That where it sounds great on the record. If you're just trying to chill and vibe. But you go to Warp Tour, you kind of want those Cookie Monster vocals or a little more high energy. Because I remember I saw Play Radio Play. Mm. I don't know if you remember that band. Yeah. But, like, their lo-fi sound, for me, it didn't kind of like, you know, I love that band. I got nothing to say, like, bad about them. But, like, I, I feel like sometimes those more lo-fi, not as hard-hitting bands had a little trouble standing out in a live setting. Because it's just like, you know... There's not enough bass, there's not enough drums, there's not a lot of full. Right. It's not high energy, and you got guys like rocking out and yeah. it's with a 90 BPM song. <laughs> it's all slow as shit. But, you know, I 
I mean, it did, obviously didn't stop him from succeeding. No. But I definitely feel like some bands like that have a trouble translating in a live yeah, setting, just, especially yeah. in a festival setting, because it's not like a venue where the sound gets trapped and it's stuck in a little contained area. It's out in the open space, and right. it's just like, man, nobody's moving. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 2012, it was my second work tour. Yeah. Our, our attack Attack was on that. Nice. That was that would have been after Austin Carlisle was in the band, huh? Yeah. So that would have been when Caleb and Johnny Frank were still in the band, though, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, my buddy at the time, I went made up with her there. She wanted to go see them because she was huge Attack Attack fan. Yeah. Uh, sure, why not? Let's go. And it, I just had a problem with the auto tune, you know? Yeah, because they definitely yeah. used it in a live setting. Yeah. And, I mean, that was a weird time, I feel like. Because I feel like maybe nowadays autotune is not nowhere near as frowned upon. Yeah. But for that time, there was only so many bands doing it, and there were only so many bands doing it well. Right. And, I mean, people love Attack Attack, so it's like, uh -huh. Sometimes in a live setting, though, it doesn't translate, mm -hmm. you know? It doesn't translate. Especially when you got, like, because Warp Tour is full of artists that can actually do that. Right. Like, actually sing and do it well. And it's like, I think at the time, when you're like a young, impressionable teen, and you're like, wow, this guy can't sing. He's not actually doing it. I'm being lied to to my face. <laughs> when you get, like, 20, 30, you're like, he's just sounding like a robot. <laughs> he just wants to be a robot, man. <laughs> but sometimes they're trying to protect you from the awful singing voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I feel like that's what Attack Attack did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. So that was 2012? 2012. Yeah, I think 2011 Warp Tour was the last Warp Tour, actually. Like, I was. Because usually, because I mean, when Warp Tour lineup would come out, you would look at the lineup and it would be like, you need at least, like, you know, five, four or five bands. It's like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to be out in the sun all day. I need to be watching these bands. I've never seen this band before. Maybe I'll go check them out. But I think like 2011, I can't really recall going to a Warped Tour after that. Just because I had a bad experience. I got a scar over my eye because I was watching Dance Gavin Dance. And that was DBM2 era. So yeah, that was when Johnny Craig was in the band. Yeah, and I just had a bad experience. I got punched in the eye, my eyebrow opened up, and I had to like sit on the sidelines and watch drugs, and it just had big bleeding eyeballs. <laughs> no fun! And it was just like, maybe I don't want to get hurt at Warp Tour anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but 2012, that would have been the year after, so you saw Attack Attack. Mm -hmm. Any, was, was there any other bands that uh, you... Some men closed out the night. Yeah. Uh, phenomenally. Uh, Take It Back Sunday, The Used, Jello Card. We're in it, and for those of you that don't follow my page, or know who I am. My bread and butter is third wave emo, so those three bands, you know, the other cards I use, Taking Back Sunday, those are literally, you know, three bands that I am heavily influenced by. Mm -hmm. um, bands with, like, real good, like, traditional punk elements, but they embrace that full-fledged, like... Emo post-hardcore style. Yeah, with a little bit of the, you know, mainstream commercial process, like... You know, it's acceptable for everyone to listen to, but yeah. if you listen to the deep cuts on those albums, it's just like, we're, we're, we're still cool, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> we're not trying to sell pizza all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, at the time, I was heavily into that one single by uh, Chunk No Captain Chunk, so I saw them as well. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, my cousin, I was savagely into Tonight Alive, mm -hmm. so we want to see them. Bayside was on that lineup too. My brother was a huge fan of Bayside, so, yeah. so we're gonna go see them. What's up? Yeah, I don't think there was ever a moment that night or that day that I just sat down and rested. I think I was at every point watching a sh watching a band. So, like you would go to Warp Tour, you stay hydrated, you never had to go to medical tent or nothing like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, I did because like yeah, they right. could stitch my eye up, but they definitely gave me like a bandage and stuff like that. Might as well put duct tape on it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's all bandage is—a little strip of duct tape. But uh, I always stayed hydrated. You know, they always had like they would have like a tent for shade, or they yeah. had like the misters. Yeah. And I think yeah. like you, you were were you out here in Arizona? No, I was out in California, out in Pomona. Oh, both times Pomona Fairplex. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I went. I've been to. I think Pomona Fairplex is probably one of the best Warp Tour like arenas because I went to Sleep Train Amphitheater in Sacramento. A lot of hard top. Yeah. But Pomona, there's a lot of grass. 
from one of our places with, with all grass. But uh, the only pe- the only problem I can because I know I know lots of people that went to Pomona. Like it's just a lot of dust. Mm-hmm. And it's just a lot, you know, and the air quality out in Southern California ain't the greatest. So there's a lot of smog warnings and stuff like that. Air quality not great, but there was lots of grass. And I remember crowd surfing for Under Oath one time. It was like after Define the Great Line came out. I like fell. Like they, they were crowd surfing me and they dropped my ass. I landed on grass. Yeah. I'm a teenager. I'm fine. I'm great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you try to crowd surf and land on hot ass like asphalt. That's not the best. <laughs> no, fucking. When was it? The year before they announced the end of Warp Tour. Yeah. They came here to Phoenix and uh, I want to go see some spell. Was that an Action Pavilion? If you're if you're not familiar, Action Pavilion is just a giant parking lot. Yeah. Uh, asphalt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I crowd surfed on Census Fail and I fell. Oof. That was the worst experience of my life. Like, did you fall on your head or did you fall on your feet? <laughs> uh, I, I landed on my elbow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. after that, my Census Fail stopped. I rushed all the way to the other side to the main stage of the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, to go see uh, the used. And I just. Elbow all banged up. Elbow all banged up. I'm sweating. I'm hot. Yeah. You know, the sun's in full blast at this moment. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm just gonna fucking go home. Luckily, like, it's actually familiar, it's like around the corner. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like a five, ten minute drive from here. So, but in this, was the, like, there was still a lot of work tour left to go, or was the. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, was, it wasn't even like eight o'clock yet. Oh, yeah. Like, I was like, I'm done. Yeah, I was like, I'm done. I, the main band I wanted to see is, you know, the use, right? Yeah. I totally get that, because I remember, like, as I got older, it definitely was like, I don't think I want to stick around anymore, and that's probably one of the reasons why like Warp Tour fell off was just people. There were less bands that people wanted to stick around for, and like I can't imagine a band traveling all the way from like Florida coming all the way to Pomona or Arizona. You're playing at eight, nine o'clock, and there's like five people left there. I'm sure that became like a common occurrence yeah. towards the end of Warp Tour, which probably made it easier for them to stop doing it. But yeah, I definitely. Getting banged up or hurting yourself at Warp Tour was definitely something that happened. Because I remember uh, I watched Aiden, most random band ever, to have the worst mosh pit ever. Because they're doing a wall of death. Uh, I'm an idiot teenager. Of course I'm going to go run around the mosh pit. Who doesn't want to swing their fists and crash into people and Aiden, not, yeah. not get in trouble? Yeah. Was, I it mean, moment? was it during Moment? Did they sing no, it? it was not Moment. <laughs> it was uh, The World by Storm. Okay. I want to say it was the word. No, no, no. I set my friends on fire. Okay, that, makes, song, that one makes sense. The song that's not named after the band. The band, I, the band I set my friends on fire because they've never heard that song before and it was just a freak coincidence. Uh, I like to call bullshit. You know? uh, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I mean, it's not too... It's, it's not too unrealistic to think that a band could, you know, because accidents happen all the time. Sometimes you, you know, this was the early days of the internet. Nowadays, there's no excuse. You can Google shit. Back then, you had to be on your computer, on the internet, go to Google, and have the, the wherewithal. But I don't think most teenagers didn't think like, "Oh, I should probably Google this and see if it's taken." Yeah, that's yeah. But I mean, Aiden definitely like they used that phrase constantly yeah. in their songs. It wasn't just a name of a song; it was referenced in their second album. It was, I think it was referenced in their third too. Yeah, the thirty P. Yeah. Yeah. The Rain and Hell EP. Yeah. It was like three albums back to back. They referenced that, and I think after the band took off, they stopped saying that kind of shit. Even though I think they did say it on their last album. Anyway, no, they said it. Yeah, yeah they, they said it a shit ton. Yeah. But um, I'm sure I set my friends on fire. I appreciate that free advertising, right? right yeah, right, absolutely. Right, yeah, right, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. You got it. I of the page. You guys yeah. are doing fucking great, phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Come to Phoenix or don't. Please do. We gotta play a show together because we both got screwed by uh, Pirate VIP. Remember? Remember, Nate? Remember? But, um, yeah. During Aiden's set, I set my friends on fire. They did a wall dead. I- Round two. Sorry. Um, I had lost uh, uh, data storage and now, now there's light and there's no natural light because it's, it took a little while to make space on my phone. Anyway, we're back with the small dick emo boyfriend. BF. <laughs> BF. Yeah. I'd say what I want. <laughs> but if you want to find that, go find it on uh, Facebook. It's um, It's got 12,000 followers, so you should go follow that. Tons of good memes and polls and uh, cool stuff that uh, Miguel here does, like DJing, which I think we should transition to and talk about. Yeah, you are...
starting your fledgling DJ career doing emo nights and riot nights and warp nights and try to go give us some insight on that what got you into that what uh, I've been going to emo nights since I was like 21 you know yeah. fucking at this you know starting next week it'll be eight years now mm -hmm. um, and I always loved it I love the community you know it's very similar at least in my opinion going to Concerts, you know, you're just in the community of people like-minded individuals who are there for the exact same reason you are Yeah, the moment they're strangers eventually they could be friends or you know, just mm -hmm. people you see on a regular basis. Yeah um, And I've always thought, you know Yeah, I'd be cool to DJ, you know, I'd be cool to make my own playlist, you know, put you know, my own spin on it, you know Yeah, going to emo nights, you know, eight years now I think you got some uh, experience. You think you can, you know, what pops off for the crowd? I definitely know what pops off. I also know what could pop off, but doesn't get played as much. Like, yeah, that's you know, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think I've been going. You know, I don't think I didn't go to my first emo night till like 2019. Okay. And that was emo night LA, which yeah. is you know one of the starters of the whole thing. Yeah, well, I would say they're the. First of the pioneers of like even I like even I L A even I Brooklyn I think were like yeah. the first two to like kind of pop up but I went 2019 um, singer from uh, some 41 was there uh, Lil Xan was there I met Lil Xan that was like the weirdest thing yeah real <laughs> they, real short real friendly but you know he's a supporter of the community so that's always good I, I think the it's a lost art how much like emo rappers soundcloud rappers kind of like breathe like a second life into emo and not a lot of like old school uh hardcore like emo fans don't give them the the credit they deserve but there's definitely out there and they give them they gave like a, a brand new audience a, a new like half-life with younger more you know because emo music don't get played on the radio not anymore <laughs> And if they did, I'm sure they'd still edit out the screams, which was probably like the whole worst thing that we ever had to experience in the early 2000s, having to hear a story of the year. And it's like, where's the screams? Oh, they edited it out. Great. I think they did that. They did that a lot. They would face down a lot. Yeah. They talking about Joe Richards apparatus. They did that a lot. Yeah. Kill Switch like, Engage, even. Kill Switch Engage. Yeah. They like, betray you. Like, they had, like, toned out a lot just to be played on the radio. Which is weird, because it's like, like I, I get censoring out swearing you know the yeah. seven words you know and the infamous words of george carlin you can't say on the radio or tv but screaming was so offensive that they like neutered it and made it more digestible for the mainstream which i mean i mean that's kind of how it's still around today i guess because they we had to do that yeah i don't i can't other than like Metalhead Mayhem or Headbangers Ball. Yeah, you don't really hear a lot of screaming in, in the radio. You know? No, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's more alternatives now, I think, than back then. Because yeah, we did have Headbangers Ball. We had Fuse TV. We had, you know, TRL was definitely not playing like no, our, like our kind yeah. of music. But we had um, like nowadays you have like Octane on Sirius FM, yeah. which is. Because I, I mean, I don't listen to mainstream radio anymore. I really don't. Like, right. I, I, you know, I'd sooner put on a CD than like try to flip through the radio stations. I think right. door dashing and like the Bluetooth, my phone being dead is like the last time I really listened to the radio. And a lot of radio is just this program blocks of whatever is the top 10. And yeah. And most of it's that. That or it's classic rock and apparently uh, my chemical romance classic rock now. <laughs> But you only I, hear the singles, like from Black Parade. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like it's the only thing you hear from my chemical or my song on the radio is the Black Parade, which is from teenagers. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard teenagers on this. I think I've heard maybe I'm I'm not okay once. Yeah. Uh, but like, don't get me wrong, Black Parade, good song, mm -hmm. but you take that out, my chemical or my song has a plethora of great music. Like I'd mm -hmm. rather listen to. Not just singles, but just like deep cuts as deep well. Deep cuts, absolutely. Like yeah. the first album, Love and Bullets. I'd rather mm. listen to them than Black Parade. I feel that, and I mean Jeff Rickley like signed them on Eyeball Records. And if you don't know who Jeff Rickley is, that's uh, the singer from Thursday. He's responsible for my Chemical Romance being around. So you better thank Jeff Rickley today. And the terrorist. Yeah. What he said. 
<laughs> but uh nah like there's a lot of that like i think like like with emo night i think there comes like there is a lot of like mainstream radio stuff played and yes. i feel like old heads are just deep cut emo kids that like they're i mean that's kind of a weird thing to say deep cut you know? <laughs> Don't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> but, um, but the, shh. yeah, but, um, yeah, there's definitely like a lot of mainstream stuff played and sometimes stuff that you, you would just sit there and be like, this is not, this is not emo. This is not like emo adjacent. And like, there are bands like, uh, the killers, I would not consider emo, no, but I would say that emo kids definitely claim the killers right. because yeah. there's a lot of messages in that music that, you know people can relate to right. and it was around during that time where it was just like it was just looped in they were playing festivals together it kind of just happened yeah but um when you were if you were to play like an even night or riot night or warp night or this coming what is it saturday saturday saturday, saturday. july 15th july 15th, that's july 15th yeah uh, where the rebel lounge the rebel lounge and yeah. Phoenix, Arizona? Phoenix, Arizona, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, <laughs> this episode will definitely be up before then, I hope. Um, I'm gonna have to edit this shit while I got some free time. But if you're in the Arizona area, or if you're like an hour or six hours, I mean, I'm six hours away. I live in Mexico and I came out here for this shit. It's important. But um, if you, you know, Emo Nights, if you were to play these things, like um, you've done a couple already, what are some songs that you've played that you were surprised by the reaction they got? Or surprised by the reaction they didn't get? Uh, I played at work night, which is basically an emo night, you know. Yeah. But I wanted to mix a little bit in, and so I put a little hip hop in it. Of course. Right? I put uh, Cuban Chokehold by Jim Class Heroes. Of course. It popped. Yeah. It popped. It, it, it heavily popped, and I thought, all right, this is, this is rad. And then I also played Against Me. Against Me, phenomenal band. Great band. Great band. Uh, probably one of the most alive punk bands today. Yeah. You know? Like, truly, honestly, thoroughly. Yeah. 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 And they do have a huge cult following with, you know, punk, alternative, and emo kids, you know? Mm -hmm. If you know, you know. They're not pop. They're not pop? They're not, pop. not their audience? Yeah, it was, uh, it was not it. That's always a shame. Yeah. Well, because shame. I feel like if anyone gives against me a chance, they're not going to find anything they don't love about it. Yeah, you know whether you're a punk fan, an emo fan, acoustic fan, uh, you know, it's it, it's there. It's yeah. definitely there. Uh, Lauren, uh, what's her name? Laura Green. Yeah, yeah, she phenomenal songwriter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And singer. And singer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah they, so it, it was weird that it didn't pop off. Um, so if you go to an emo night and you hear against me, like fix your fucking head and pop. Pop off! Pop off! <laughs> pop off! Definitely. And if you don't know what pop off means, I mean, I learned that term in like 2009. I think it's just you know, get excited. Yeah. In pro wrestling, a pop is a good thing. It's when everybody cheers and yeah. is engaged. And I think that's also kind of a lost art in the modern age of music because I've been to shows, and if you don't know, uh, when a band's done playing and they're headlining, if you want to hear another song, you got to chant one more song. And usually, nine times out of ten, when you do that, the band will come back on stage, play ad adult peekaboo with you, and play another song. And Most I've likely it's the greatest song they've written. Hmm? Most likely it's the greatest song they've or written. Or the biggest deep cut they got. Or the, or yeah. the yeah. If you really want to hear it. But, because, um, I, 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 you know, recently, I, I've seen Craig Owens play, Crowd Chanted, and... You know, you get a deep cut. They played Lindsay Quit Lollygagging, which is like the first song. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the first song that he ever wrote when he was like 15. Yeah. And um, I was at Stola's, and if you don't know who Stola is, is that's uh, Sergio Medina. He's an idola. Dance Kevin. He, he's been playing bass for Dance Kevin Dance. Uh, Stola's played a show. Room was packed. Everybody's there, and I don't know if it's just the, the age demographic or just. Uh, Weird habits, I don't know. They didn't chant one more song, and night was over. Everybody went home. <laughs> Which is weird, because you'd think that, you know, you chant one more song, you, you'd, get a, you'd get one. It's, At least. It's kind of like an unwritten rule for bands. If, yeah. if the audience wants more, they'll get more. 
And I think that's kind of the same thing at Emo Nights. It's kind of like when you play music and you see people react to it, you're going to probably, that DJ is going to be like, all right, I'm going to save that in my head. We're going to play that one at the next show. And unfortunately, I think the thing that people do is they'll play No Doubt. They'll play like early Blink-182 before they were super emo or they'll play later Blink-182 that's not emo at all. They'll play some Angels and Airwaves that's not really emo. Or they'll just play something that's radio mainstream rock because it'll get a reaction because everybody knows it. It's a popular song. And then that's how you get emo nights that are full of music that's not emo. And you got old hipsters like me complaining, being fat and old and not happy that they're they're playing songs that aren't from my age or just something I don't consider because I'm a hipster, I'm a, I'm a horrible person. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's something where, I mean, that's gotta be discouraging. You play against me and nobody's like vibing or nobody's getting down. It's kind of just like, well, I guess I don't play that one ever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, on their defense, I did play uh, a deep cut. <laughs> I, I played I'm a, uh, Baby I'm an Anarchist. Yeah. Yeah. You just was that not their top played song on Spotify? No. Uh, well, my friend, one of very good friend of mine, I asked them, you know, what I guess music would like me to play. Mm. I, I asked for that one, so you know, I'm gonna deliver. Of course. Yeah. Oh, well, they were there, right? They were there, yeah. They so, were happy, they right? Were happy. It was you had like, one person popping off. That's good. At least. At least. At least. <laughs> You don't want a room where nobody gives a shit. Right? right, you don't want to be that DJ. So obviously going into this, when I was making my playlist, I think to myself, what well, bands absolutely pop off? And then I know, because I've gone, like I said, eight years in the making of me being, you know, a constant emo night goer, I know, all right, well, they always play this song. They sometimes play this song. They never play this song. Mm -hmm. So when I was making my playlist, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to play this song because this song doesn't get played. I play this song because I only got played a couple of times. I'm gonna play this song because I know this song pops off instantly. Yeah. So I, I went in just thinking like, what's what's gonna work? What I think is gonna work? What I would want myself to hear at an emo night? Mm -hmm. You know? Of course. Yeah. Something that would make somebody like with your experiences, your shows that you've been to, the music that you listen to in your personal time, something that you would like to hear if you were to go into an emo night and you weren't the DJ. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, after one of my recent experiences, I won't name names, but um, I think after one of my recent experiences, definitely make your playlist longer than 45 minutes. <laughs> Fucking I, please. If it's in between, like if you have a playlist for in between, like uh, if you have guest DJs or guest performances, Make your playlist longer than 45 minutes. And those... make sure you guys don't play in the same songs over and over again. Like, I don't <laughs> want to hear Sugar We're Going Down three times in a night. Yeah. You know? I, I don't hate the song. No, a phenomenal song. That, do, 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 yeah. that drum intro. Phenomenal. Great. Phenomenal. I don't even think I... <laughs> I, will, uh, I don't think I heard that song. That, that event we went to. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't. That's weird. I'm That's thinking weird. about that right now. I'm thinking yeah. about songs we didn't hear. We... I don't think I heard one. I think that song was not being played. Yeah, that song was that, not That was not played at all. I think uh, Sons of Spell was played. Yeah. Like yeah. Three times. Th same three songs. Or the same song three times. Is, is Teenage Dirtbag an emo song? I wouldn't consider it an emo I think it's alternative. I definitely think uh, it's alternative. I would say pop rock. Pop rock? Pop, pop punk? Rock, yeah. 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 But it's not like... That, that song got like a recent resurgence because of like TikTok. But it's still a staple in the genre, right? Yeah, you within know, the alternative yeah, genre. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's not a popular yeah. song, but I, w I don't know if I would consider it emo. Even yeah, though I think not. the new age of like TikTok emo kid like has definitely co-opted that. And this is the... why we need to gatekeep. Yeah, bully people. I mean, um, gatekeep. Bully people, I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, you're going to make me cyber bully? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, I mean, there's importance into that. There's importance. I think gatekeeping has its merits to a certain degree because, I mean, certain people don't belong in a scene, like bigots and pieces of shit that just want to hate on people for their, Trap. Yeah, for their creed, color, or race, or personal identity. You know, that kind of shit, like, is not tolerated in the scene. Not. It's not punk. It never, it never has been. No, because yeah. if you don't know, emo, post-hardcore, 
pop rock, uh, alternative. It's all rooted in punk, which is just anything that doesn't sound like it belongs in the mainstream. And it seems like it's mainstream to hate people of marginalized groups, unfortunately, in some parts of this world. And if you got that in your body, fix it. <laughs> it's not cool. Hating isn't cool. Hating is a waste of time, too. Hating, <laughs> like, it's so dumb when these people are like, you know, gatekeeping punk rock, but still support, you know, politicians. They get some fascists. They get some fascists, exactly. Yeah. Like, if, if you consider yourself a fan of punk rock, but you also say Blue Lives Matter, you're stupid. Like, I'm sorry, you <laughs> are. Like, in the 80s, or early, well, whenever punk rock started. 76. 76. Late 60s, right. early 70s. So they were always anti, you know, fascists, you know, anti cops, anti politicians, right? Anarchists. Anarchy, yeah. yeah. It's always and a good a, thing. It's always a good thing. And then when hip hop started coming, hip hop was very, you know, the exact same, right? Mm -hmm. uh, rooted. Very rooted, right? Yeah. I, I, I like to say that hip hop and punk are first cousins. Yeah. You know, uh, these punk bars were having hip hop artists play at their bars. So they wouldn't get in trouble by the cops and have them playing in the streets, right? Yeah. And then when hip hop bars started opening up, they were doing the exact same thing to local punk artists, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't have punk rock without hip hop. You can't have rock and roll without, you know, without black, without soul, you know? Mm -hmm. It's R and B, everything. Exactly. Like, it's all connected. Rhythm and blues is all kind of like it was all created by people that went through struggle. And had something to say and it was rooted in like deep heart and emotion kind of like emo music but it's one of those things where it's kind of like hate and music doesn't really belong because while you can get your aggression and your anger out in music using it to platform and a positive note yeah and a positive note because you can know, go mosh you go have a good time with a bunch of dudes and with studded belts and you know battle jackets it's like supposed to feel better afterwards you're not supposed I know, to I do yeah. yeah you don't go somewhere to unite and hate and just to hate anybody whether it be just because of what kind of music they listen to what color their skin is it's not right and it's just like I think places like emo nights I've never experienced anything like that I've never seen any stupidity like that because it's kind of like these events exist so people can connect with something that they either had in their youth or they're young and they want to go somewhere with the kind of music they admire, with musicians they admire, or like the artists that wrote stuff that connects to their heart. And I feel like to truly connect to people at a heart level, you know, that's love. That's not hate. You right. can talk about your hate, you can articulate it in a certain fashion, but if you're like using it as a platform to like try to like push people down, it doesn't, it just doesn't go. That's not punk. It's not. No. No, yeah, absolutely. And all this stuff it. is rooted in punk. Right? Yeah, and it's just, yeah. It's not cool to be dick. It's not. <laughs> but. But bully people. Cyber, we call it gatekeeping. <laughs> Polite bullying. Yeah, Polite bullying. Gatekeeping just... with a cause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it can all be in good fun. And I think that's a lot of what people miss. Like, from Warp Tours. You know, when they go to emo nights like this, they want to have fun and forget that we live on a world that's constantly on fire. Cause, right. You know, it's it's not easy to, like, you know, work a nine to five, go to fucking take care of your kids, go to, like, you know, pay your bills. It's like, you want these things to be an escape. And when you invite all those volatile, toxic elements, it's like, it's kind of like prolonging the bullshit that is life that yeah. we all have to endure. <laughs> Yeah, without a doubt. So, on that note, um, let's talk about your your magical, wonderful Facebook page, Small Dick Emo BF. BF. I said it right this time. You said it right this time. I'm proud of you. <laughs> How did that start? And if you don't know, <laughs> Small Dick it D is S O S M O L D I C. It's two C's. Two C's. D I C C. Emo. Emo? Yeah. BF. Space together. Or like all that. Yeah, yeah. How did that start? Why did you start <laughs> it? And how did it get popular? Uh, 
So, just going randomly through Facebook, I would see all these pages that I'm sure you've seen as well. You know, thick emo GF, you know, small goth GF, shit like that, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all basically just thirst traps. Thirst traps. <laughs> so, I'm a huge fan of parodies. Yeah, Weird Al. Weird Al, yeah. scary movies, you oh, know, yeah. Yeah. Leslie Nielsen, oh, yeah. Slapstick, Airplane, yeah. yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan of all that, you know. Uh, I love a good joke, and I thought, how funny would it be if I did this page? So I did, I, I, I made it, and I just was posting memes, I would find steel and shit like that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really, you know, I didn't think it popped off, word of the day that I didn't think it'd pop off as much as it did. And then when I started realizing that people are actually following me, I started taking it a little more seriously. Not as seriously, because I don't think anything should be taken too seriously. I, I, I've known you for how long? Uh, we've known each other a good, like, two, three months now. Two, three months now. You've been following me. I have been following you. And when I was on Demo Team Podcast, you were following me back then, too. Yeah. Like, well over a year at yeah. this point. Yeah. We're, we're, we're oddly familiar with one another but we've only known each other on a personal level like a few months a few months yeah yeah but but you can say that i try not to take not to try not taking myself too seriously yeah you know I, I i don't i i love a good joke you know i don't mind being all right no more edits no more no more stops no more fuck ups no more uh running out of space on my, my phone it's supposed to have 130 gigs what do you have on your phone that takes up all that space? Pictures, memes, polls, album covers, videos from shows. <laughs> You're never gonna watch again. Uh, I just repost them. Yeah, I do that. But too. I just I had to delete TikTok, so then where am I gonna post them now? Instagram, Facebook. threads. <laughs> but um, where we last left off was you were talking about your Facebook page. I think around the time, when did it pop off? Like, when did it start going for you? Word of the day, pop off. But when did it start going right? Like, what did you notice that you were doing that made it go from, like, five followers to 12,000? I was just constantly just posting memes. You know, I create or memes I steal. And it started getting traction. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know when it went from, I, I really can't put a specific. You don't have like I a, don't. like a memory of a meme that just went. I, d I really don't. Really? Yeah. Cause I'll be honest with you. I've never really paid attention to the numbers. Never. Mm -mm. That's like, I'm like the total opposite. <laughs> I, I, I go out of my way. I mean, I can tell you like the first meme I ever had that went viral, like really bad, like, like thousands of shares, like thousand reacts stuff like that was Lady Dimitrescu or Lady Dimitrescu from Resident Evil 8 I just found like every single like that when that meme craze started off I just compiled all of them in like an 80 image album and that shit got a lot of traction and then I shared a YouTube video that I made which was just like a reference which is it's literally just a scene from Dracula Dead and Loving It which is a Leslie Nielsen movie Mel Brooks made it and I just like labeled, like I just put a bunch of shit that made it like kind of related to Resident Evil 8 and Silent Hill. It's out there still. It's got like 180, 160, maybe 150,000 views, something like that. But just because of that meme like blowing up, just sharing a bunch of Lady Dimitrescu memes I made and other people have made, it just like, it was a shit ton of traction. And I, I've never seen like my meme career like ever like reach that pinnacle again. I'm, always chasing the next viral thing but i don't know i can remember like i think my most popular poll got like eight thousand reacts you know i'm stupid i keep track with this shit. no no <laughs> trying to figure out like because you want to try like replicate success you know like right. you can't do the same shit over and over and over again but you want to be able to figure out what people like and what's hitting and what's popping off yeah. word of the word day, of the day right but, there. uh you want to figure out like what people are like looking into that way you can kind of try to manipulate it so you can have some form of success success notoriety or something like that 
Right. And I, I try to do that. Like, you know, so I following your page. I was like, a poll, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's a fun idea. That's a good idea. I started doing that. And I did it. But keeping track the end of the day is kind of, like, tiring for me. Yeah. It's you very know? time consuming. Yeah. yeah. And, like, if you got, like, a regular life, work, and or school, or yawns um you uh it's hard to keep up with that stuff because it's it's time consuming trying to keep up trying to make fresh content and trying to stay up with trends and trying to stay up with what's funny and not just falling back on what's comfortable yeah and that's like a lot of everybody's favorite bands do that (laughs) yeah yeah um yeah i really can't think of a specific time because like i said like when you mentioned that i have that many followers Mm -hmm. I think to myself, do I really? Because, I mean, every time I post, I get lucky if I get one like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's such a thing, like, like Facebook, unfortunately, most social medias, uh, they go out of their way to kind of give your reach to your following. And it seems like sometimes when you have larger followings, it's like to your detriment. Because they want to take the money out of your pocket, so you'll pay to boost posts to show it to your own audience that you've accumulated which it seems counterintuitive yeah but i mean i was like scrolling through your page you do still have stuff that like pops off a little bit and i think it's one of those things because like as you said you don't really pay attention you're just like yeah oh, i post what i want and if it works it works yeah but like were you to to like, like see what's what's hitting or just utilize, I mean, you're on Facebook, so you'd have to utilize, like, Facebook groups or uh, just finding ways to engage your audience to where they want to just kind of, like, circulate on your page or, like, come back. And I, I went to cosmetology school, like, I, I you know, I, I, I couldn't, I can't, I don't cut hair or anything, but I took a lot of classes on, like, you know, customer service and stuff like that and a big thing that I always kept from that time is this thing called customer retention which is how to keep people coming back right because like with haircutting it's like you know anybody can get a ten dollar haircut from supercuts or whatever but it's the way you treat people your kindness your candor and or just like you know you apply that to content where it's just kind of like you want to create something that makes people want to come back and like polls and stuff are good and I you know lots of people will copy me or try to use polls like similar to me, but there's aspects of it that are missing, and that's why they don't see the same replicated success. And I'm not gonna start to say sit here and say I'm the best poll man in the world or I invented polls, because I didn't. I literally got the idea of working with like Craig Owens' uh, team, like his promotional team it's like PR team and they literally gave me the idea it was like a radio head poll like they showed me to do you should try doing something like this engage with the Facebook group and try to do like you know something to kind of keep people like it's like a game you know that's that's basically it. it's fucking the hide and go seek for adults mm-hmm. or whoever's using Facebook and it's kind of like you know when you do album polls or you do song polls it's kind of like like being a DJ and stuff like that you kind of want to pick and choose stuff that you know is popular but me being me I always try to throw something that's like totally obscure totally random, totally random has nothing to do with I any of the genres idea. yeah and it's just like sometimes that's what works yeah it's like it, you create you put on like Cody versus like Guy Fieri <laughs> yeah I literally had a poll <laughs> Cody and Cambria versus Jesus, Bacon, Batman, <laughs> Cats, Chicken Strips, Hot Wings. It's just randomness. And it's like unapologetically random because right. why not? Yeah, because why not? You know, and I feel like it goes back to like what I said about you, you get the joke. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you don't either want, get it or you don't. Yeah, you don't want to take yourself too seriously because why? 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 Nobody wants to be that super self serious person on the internet. Cause yeah. Of, that's how you end up being like trapped and getting made fun of by everybody. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The village punching bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it really just goes down to like, I just do it for fun. Yeah. You know, like yes. there's no rhyme or reason to it. There shouldn't be a rhyme or reason. Yeah. There's no rhyme or reason to life. It really isn't. Yeah. And, but I mean, you find those rhymes like poetry, and sometimes you can kind of 
turn get, could, some, get something out of it. Yeah. yeah. And it was something like a tw like where a page with like twelve thousand reach and like I mean when you do DJ sets like for this emo night that's on uh, July fifteenth. The Rebel Lounge. The Rebel Lounge. Lounge. It starts at seven, eight? Nine. 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 Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, doors open at nine o'clock. My buddy Mitch, Sad and Bougie, hits the stage. After uh Sad and Bougie hits the stage, it's your, it's your lady. Nikki Vicious. Nikki Vicious, oh, a good wow. friend of a friend of mine. Yeah. I love her to death. Yeah. She's awesome people. Good people. Very good people. Very but good. You people. go on after her. Does the small on. dick emo BF go? I go on after Nikki Vicious. Yeah. And then after uh, me, Sad and Bougie takes up the night for the rest of the night until. Uh, Just chills and hangs out and plays all the sad bougie shit. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, nine o'clock. The Rebel Lounge. Yeah. Uh, Twenty one and over. 21 and over. <coughs> of course. Yeah, 21 and over. That's why it's at 9. Yeah. So you feel real tired. Yeah. When you're over 21. Yeah, my back hurts. Yeah, it already yeah. hurts. But um, I guess one thing that we should cover and go over, because I think it's something that we both have in common. Um, I'm a musician. Most people don't know me as a musician, which is weird. I'm more known for polls and shit posting and podcasting. And what? You, <laughs> you're playing in my hands? What? Yeah, I, I scream out guys. Um, guy. <laughs> I scream on guy, spoken words sometimes, but um, we were talking about it earlier, but you have experience being a musician, being in bands, can you shed light on that? Like, what was something that you, like, what was the first instrument you learned how to play? What was your first band? What were you doing in this band? Uh, my first instrument I had to play was guitar. I was 12 years old, mm -hmm. around 12 years old. Um, my cousin, I would hang out with my cousin, same cousin who, you know, took me to concerts, who had me hang out with his friends, same guy, um, you know, he was in a band, he plays bass, I thought that was the coolest shit ever. Yeah. And then I was like, hey, you know, I want to play the guitar, I want to play the drums, I want to play the bass, I want to be that guy, you know? I want to know how to play everything. Yeah. Do you and know how to play a little bit of everything? A little bit of everything, a little bit of guitar, a little bit of bass, a little bit of drums, I'm pretty sure you're staying in my guest bedroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the disassembled drum kit. Yeah, I was looking at that, I was admiring, yeah. I was like, yeah, he's he's had, he's got like a lot of musician friends that are storing shit here, or he knows how to use all this shit. I I am, I am good and I am modern enough in every little piece of instrument where people can think I'm talented. Oh yeah yeah. I mean, they give you an instrument, you can get something out of it. Yeah yeah yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. Would uh -huh. you say like you're better at one of these instruments than the other? Or more confidence? Yeah. Better, not really the the right more word. Efficient. <laughs> more, I feel like I'm more confident in one thing more than I am that to another. And what would that be? I feel like I'm more confident in being vocals on vocals. Cool. That counts cool. under that instrument. I, mean, I saw you last night at Riot Night. Oh, yeah. And you were singing some Simple Plan. Yeah. Good Charlotte. Is that Good Charlotte? Good Charlotte. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still not emo. But no, it isn't. But right. <laughs> yeah, it is an emo. It is an emo. It's too mainstream. It's manufactured. <laughs> I could have sworn it was Simple Plan. <laughs> it might have been Simple Plan. It might have been. It might have been. I don't, I don't know. know. They I both sound so tested. similar and manufactured. <laughs> but <laughs> you killed it. You, you still owned it. Yeah. Yeah, That's without a doubt. Your, your shirt was like three buttons down. I was, and you were just like. I was toasted. It. I was toasted. I you was, were toasted. I was but toasted. You, still, you were still in the zone. And it yeah. makes sense that you would say you're most proficient in that. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, makes sense to me. Yeah, um, my first band, I was a guitarist uh, with um, a family friend. What was this band called? Broken Avenger. That's pretty dope, man. I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty cool. Yeah. The Broken Avenger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of reminds me of uh, Matt Cutchell of Emo's Not Dead. Yeah. Your Broken Hero. Yeah. Like, yeah, it used to be yeah. that We were a ska band. Ah. <laughs> huh? <laughs> a three piece ska band. And we had one song, and this was this was very early on in my guitar playing. Like, what kind of ska are we talking? Are we talking like Goldfinger ska? Are we talking about like Real Big Fish ska? Are we talking like what is that? The, it like, was more like Sublime. Yeah. More like Sublime ska, like not a lot of horns too, because it was a three-piece band. Yeah, yeah. And it was just more like a ding, ding, more up, ding, more ding. Up swing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more like that. Uh, after that. Uh, me and my very good friend, love this dude to death, um, Lorenzo. I don't think you've met yet. I don't think so. No, I don't no. think you've met yet. Lorenzo, we will meet one day. We 
Ron's out. Okay, Shout we have out. Ozzy, thank you for shaking the camera. You were essential. Ozzy, Ozzy is top tier. Yeah, Ozzy's a cat. You may have seen him scurrying along back here earlier. He's uh, he's the reason why the camera just shaked and why we have all this negative space up here. <laughs> Let's fix that real quick. Uh, that's good enough. <laughs> uh, he was in a band in high school, mm -hmm. um, and he's like, man, comfy vocals, and the only song we knew how to play was My Curse by Killswitch. Yeah? That's the only song we taught ourselves how to play. A one metalcore song? And that one you, did that would you guys play that for like 10 15 minutes that's it yeah and just, <laughs> just in somebody's garage yeah <laughs> um they wanted to ignore five finger death punch but dang no. that's crazy that five finger death punch and kill switch engage are in the same conversation it's wild, right? <laughs> it's right. wild. um after that bands here and there mm -hmm. uh you know jam sessions here and there with friends and stuff like that the moment, yeah, I have people hitting me up, you know, telling me to join their band, stuff like that, but I think it just comes down to, like, a lot of nerves, you know? You know? Do you feel like the difference between performing in a band and being a DJ is, like, night and day? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's, like, not, not to, like, <coughs> talk down any DJs, you know? Very good friends of mine are DJs. And I, I know the struggle with it, you know, creating like the good pun is gonna pop up. You know, the very struggle, you know, creating like a good playlist to make and stuff like that. But I, you mentioned this before when we were talking earlier today, or you mentioned it in your first episode mm -hmm. about, you know, yeah, you're doing this and it's fun. But it's not your baby. It's not what you're. Yeah. You know, it's not something that you're doing. It's something that you're doing for others. Yeah. And know? joining a band is definitely a collaborative effort. Yeah. It's like a think tank, and working with musicians can be kind of frustrating because, unfortunately, I mean, not every band. It's not all bands. You know, hashtag not all bands, but most bands that people join, and you know, involve themselves with. Either it's all for one, one for all, or there's one dude that's obviously more talented than everybody and kind of like writes and leads and it's kind of his project or their project or her project, whatever. It's one of those things where sometimes bands have leaders who kind of write everything and kind of direct everybody. And then there are bands where you got like a big, e, you know, you got a big egotistical dickhead that, that thinks they control everybody, everything. <laughs> they have it all written down in paper and they're the boss and everybody has to fall in line. And you're trying to find a band that's not like one of those, you know, where it's just kind of like you're in charge or you're in an environment where the collaboration is like 100%. Like it feels cohesive and bands are stressful. And, yeah. and you, you know, I'm 34, you're. 29 on Tuesday. Tuesday so you're 28 right now but you're at that kind of age where it's like I don't have time for band drama bullshit right is that how you feel about it yeah I mean not just that you know it's not just the band drama bullshit because yes I've dealt with that but you know I work in 9 to 5 Monday to Friday yeah you know there's I have very seldom time to like you know sit down and write yeah. You know, like when I come home from work, I do chores on weekends. When we have my lady, I'm doing chores, shit like that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, goes going back to the, you know, it's not my, it, it, it's not my project. You yeah. You know, like I, I. And you haven't found anything that you feel like you want to like put yourself out there for that collaborative effort. I feel like I have. I have this friend who, you know, him and I have talked about, we just haven't done anything about it so far. It's just what he wants to do. He's a very talented musician, very talented guy. He's able to, you know, tell him, you know, you can tell him, I want something that sounds like this. He can find it, and he he he, he understands the assignment. Yeah. You know? He shows up and understands. Yeah. But it's very to a point where he wants it to be his project. He wants it to be done specifically. Yeah. Which there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Please, absolutely use me to help yourself, you know. Yeah. 
but I also want to work on stuff that I want, you know? Yeah. You want your voice heard as well in, this, in any project you would do. Exactly. Nobody wants to feel like they're just writing someone else's shit or playing just someone else's shit. Right. Like, might as well join a cover band. Exactly. Yeah. There's and nothing actually, wrong with cover bands. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with cover bands. You actually make money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only time you can make money playing music is playing someone else's music. Exactly. Never forget. But, um, let's see. If you could start a band, and, like, you know, money's no object, you know, whatever members you need you can get, whatever sound design that you want to do, if you could make a project and everything 100% would go right, you know, it doesn't have to, like, blow up or pop off, but, it, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, be successful, but it can be inspirationally and creatively satisfying what kind of band or project music project would you do that is i mean so again going back to you know i'm a huge fan of third wave emo and post hardcore you know mm -hmm. uh, bands like thrice silverstein the used you mm -hmm. know those the golden are, age. The golden <laughs> age, yeah. The golden yeah. era. Uh, those bands just always seem right to me. And not to say, you know, bands aren't doing that specific sound anymore because there's plenty of bands that still, you know, sound like that these days mm -hmm. and, you know, are very well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that I would like to do, you know? Like, see, the, my, my opinion of a perfect band is 46 members. 46 member? 4 to 6. Oh, 4 to 6. I was going to say, 4 to 6 member. What kind of ska band are you going to start? <laughs> uh, 4 to 6 members. Um, someone's always doing something. Yeah. You know, whether it be, you know, a drummer, yeah. obviously, yeah. and a bassist. You know, yeah. the heart and soul of the band. Yeah. Uh, two guitarists. Maybe one of the guitarists is also a singer. You know, I love a good synth. I love a good keyboard, you know. Yeah. The Get Up Kids, Reggie and the Full Effect, oh, yeah. um, the Motion City soundtrack, you know, mm -hmm. bands like that, you know. Yeah. And obviously the vocalist, the front man, who could yeah. also be, you know, a instrument player. Yeah. Who doesn't actually learn to have to be, yeah. but they could be. Always work when you have a singer, screamer. You know? Yeah. Maybe he's playing keys, maybe he's also doing bass, or, you know. I, I always love bands like that where all hands are on deck. Yeah. Like everybody, yeah. you know, there's no one sitting around waiting for their turn to play. Right. Nobody, right. nobody wants to watch that band. And no. that's, that's why I love Thrice. Like, yeah. Thrice is such a top tier band for me because everyone's doing something, you know? Yeah. If it's just a slow, quiet song, you still have someone playing the keys, you right. know? The drums always have a part, you know? Mm -hmm. And Dustin's range on vocals and lyrics. Yeah. Um, I feel that. And it's like, you know, I love Thrice, Stare at the Sun. That's like one of my favorite Thrice songs. I've seen them, the last time I think I saw Thrice was 2015, Taste of Chaos. Okay. It was like the return of Taste of Chaos. I think they did like two, three years and they hung it up again. But yeah, Thrice played a wonderful set. There was all kinds of great bands there. That yeah. day. It was 2015. It had like Jimmy World sort of the year. Uh, Thrice was there, Dashboard Confessional, All American Rejects, Mark Hoppus played a DJ set, right Adair, Story of the Year, I think I just said that like twice, but, you know, it was just like a really good lineup, it was a great way to like bring it back, and it was awesome too, because it was like the first time something had come to San Bernardino, where I was living at the time, and, you know, I'm sure you lived out in that area, we don't get shit out there, we you either gotta go to uh, LA, yeah. Anaheim, or San Diego. You get gunshots in San Bernardino. Yeah, you get gunshots and hobos. And but, drugs. Yeah, lots of drugs. Not the band. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, lot, yeah, without a doubt, like, that was a good set. Thrice is a great band. And, shit, man, like, I don't want to tell you what to do with your life, but, shit, like, there's always room for that era of, like, post hardcore emo type music. And, shit, you ever find the time or you get some vacation time or you get a summer break or, you know, you should do that shit, guy. You need a screamer, guy. Hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> I do shit that. in Arizona right now. Yeah. But, um, that. No, absolutely. Uh, we pop off together. We pop off. That's the name of the band, pop off. Yeah, pop <laughs> off. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Not set it off. Not to get confused with set it off. No, no, no. Yeah. Pop it off. Pop it off. <laughs> pop pop it off. off. <laughs> it's all one word, maybe. <laughs> we'll sell t-shirts. <laughs> but, I mean, aside that, 
Yeah, I, pretty, I think that pretty much covers it. We went over all, a little bit of everything. I mean, this show is obviously in its infancy, but like I always tell everybody I interview, like if you ever want to come back, always welcome to come back. I mean, obviously, I'm at your house right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> hopefully, I can come back. Then it doesn't, you know, it could always because I got a, I got Zoom. You know, if you yeah. ever, uh, hop on like a, pa I'm trying to do panel episodes. I have, I interviewed a lot of cool people i know a lot of cool artists i'm trying to organize like four man episodes six man episodes just get a bunch of people who like music or shit posting or memes and stuff just get them in a room just like hear plenty of cool conversation but you know one-on-ones are always fun and i'm trying to do more record live on the scene type shit so this is definitely fun um tell people when emo night is how they can find it where it's at one more time emo night uh july 15th uh, at the rebel lounge in phoenix arizona if you're in the area you'll be in the area this saturday you can easily find tickets rebellounge.com phenomenal place uh used to be for the older heads here in arizona or no uh used to be called the mason jar very famous place um yeah rebellounge.com do it Emo Night Phoenix. Show starts at 9. Show starts at 9. DJs, drinks. There's also, um, if I remember correctly, there's a contest that you guys are going to do. Like a dance contest. Yeah. Free yeah. tattoo. Yeah. Win the dance contest, get a free tattoo. Yeah, by uh, actually one of my very good friends. Uh, Does she know? She know. Yeah. yeah, she know. She know. She's on she TikTok. Know. Go follow She know on TikTok. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she know. Phenomenal human being. Great tattoo artist. Uh, they actually did my Nirvana tattoo on my knee. Nice. The bat. Nikki Vicious also has a tattoo. And it's a chocobo and a cacti. Yeah. She does cool shit. Yeah. So you're getting a free tattoo by somebody that's like... If you know how to dance. You know how to dance. Uh, Even if you don't know how to dance. Can, right? can we say to what song? What? Can we say to what song? Is it, is it to a specific song? That's what I was told. Is it? That's what I was told. I didn't know that. See, you're a part of the show. I'm not. Yeah. So you know more than me. I, I, I got to request one song during Nikki Vicious's... Uh, that, yeah, that's like, <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's all I get. Yeah. But, just uh, a song. A yeah, song. A song. But I mean, she's got a whole hour. You know, sometimes yeah. you can only fit in yeah. one song with all those emo bangers. And yeah. I picked the most obscure song I could find. You just, did. I'm I'm fully prepared for nobody in the room to know what that song is. All right, well, um, as long as you know what's gonna happen. Oh, well, it's all right. I'm <laughs> gonna just request that she just make a little announcement beforehand, just so you know, honor the homies who are no longer with us. Maybe I should make it the the more popular band that they do that. That would make sense. I mean, yeah. I mean, that I probably should talk about that stuff before I let you go. Okay, uh, if you watched episode one, uh, that was before the Jordan Blake Memorial. If you didn't know, um, I went to the Jordan Blake Memorial. Do you want to get more centered? Hmm? Do you want to get more centered on this? It's true. Oh, no, I'm fine right here. I love being in the corner. People don't like looking at me. Um, my back hurts, so I'm going to lay like a, a fat, like a old guy right now. But it's a uh, fat dude from South Park. Yeah, that's me. But um, yeah, between now, between now and the last episode, uh, I went to Sacramento, went to the Jordan Blake Memorial. Lovely, lovely time. Lots of cool people. Lots of good vibes. It probably, I'll probably never be. I mean, I'm sure I'll probably end up going to another memorial show in my lifetime. But yeah, the vibes in that room were amazing. Uh, Johnny Craig, OG, Escala Drive lineup. Great show. It's probably the best. I they've... saw videos. Yeah. Phenomenal. It yeah. So good. It sounds just like the CD with just a different singer. And I'm sure homie upstairs smiling down and enjoyed that. I got to do guest vocals during According to Columbus. If you're not, you've never seen the Jordan Blake Memorial, look it up. There's hashtags on every social media platform. I've busted my ass trying to make sure if you're a fan of that time, of that era, that you go watch it because it's great stuff. Good homie, great guy. I miss that guy every day. Rest in peace, Jordan Blake. And I think between this episode and the last episode, I also I came out here to Arizona like a, I want to say like a week and a half ago at this point. But uh, we also went down to the American Standard show. It's like their last all ages show at the Nile, the Underground. I believe yeah. that was that. Yeah. Yeah, I attended that. There yeah. was some great was, bands there. Uh, what was it? Ghost Killer? Like what was that? 
first who was the red streak I said? Oh, that's Death.gov. Death.gov. They yeah, they were great. They Cowboy Bebop so... Core, dude. Like yeah. he was at the right last night. He was, know, yeah, Koba. yeah. Koba. Yeah. Yeah. He did guitars for uh, Sorry X. Yeah. Yeah, he's he was the bass player. Bass player. Yeah, yeah he's the bass player. Great vocalist, great guy, great band. He's in not nearly sorry. He was, I think he's just helping out with Sorry X. Oh, he was just helping out with Sorry yeah. X. Yeah, he's helping out with Sorry X. Um, he plays in Not Nearly. They're going on tour with Cicadia, Humble Abode, and Not Nearly. He's playing in Not Nearly. I also saw the Craig Owens, Kurt Travis tour twice. I went to the Anaheim show and the Arizona date. The Arizona date was the hottest fucking show I've ever been to. It's hot as hell in that room. <laughs> Uh, Nile Underground is great. It's so good. Amazing. I can't wait to see it in winter. But that tour was great. Unfortunately, if you're uninformed, the Craig Owens Kirk Travis tour had to be cut short because there was a accident with their van. Mitch and Rob. Uh, Mitch is basically, you know, he's from Burials. He's basically Craig Owens' whole backing band. He's a one-man band. And Rob, he's the tour photographer, tour manager. Uh, their van flipped three times and unfortunately since then Mitch has had to have like four surgeries you know Rob got banged up pretty bad all love and prayers and good vibes out to them uh, it's unfortunate the tour got cancelled it sucks it was a great show if you got to see it share your videos shit man like always go out to see your friends when they go play tour man you never know what could be the last time life is precious it sucks that you know, we can lose people, appreciate your people. Cause there's lots of good people out there and I know emo and all that other stuff. We're all in tune with our feelings. Don't be afraid to share that you care about your people. Cause you never know when it could be the last time you see them. And I think that pretty much updates us from the last episode. Do you have anything else you wanted to promote or put out? You want to plug your socials so people can find you or, uh, I'm sure they can find flyers for Emo Night on like what Rebel Lounge's Instagram or something or yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, Facebook page on the Rub site on our Instagram. Also, you know, if you get a chance, follow. Uh, it's hashtag Emo Night on Instagram. That's literally what it is. Hashtag Emo Night. Uh, hashtag Emo Night Phoenix. Yeah, that's what it is. But I think would it be Phoenix spelled out or it'd be P H X? P H X. So Emo Night P H X. Emo Night P H X. It's hashtag Emo Night P H X. Um. If you want, follow my Facebook. Uh, just spell it M O B F uh, S M O L space D I C space. Was it two D C's? Two two C's. So D I C C. D I C C. Yes, that's a D I C. Yes. S M O L D I C C. E M O B F. If you don't know how to spell emo, it's E M O and then B F space B F. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Go follow that. This is Miguel Angel, right? Miguel Cruz. God damn it. No, it's fine. It's not your fault. Is that your Facebook name, though? Miguel Angel is my Facebook name, yeah. But don't follow that. <laughs> or do. I don't or care. Do. I, I don't care. You got uh, an Instagram, a Twitter, a Twitter, a TikTok? I, uh, yeah, actually. my uh, I have an Instagram for Spotted Game OBF. <laughs> I don't use it. I don't use it. It's got uh, like 17 but, followers. <laughs> about. <laughs> Um, the obscure page. The obscure page. That's where he shares the real spicy stuff. I that's where I show my left. Yeah. Uh, I have my personal Instagram, yeah. which is uh, the word lowercase underscore Miguel. Yeah. Um, I have a Twitter. I just don't remember my handle for Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's dying. Bro. Twitter's you gotta get a thread, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My, 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 I, I mean, people still use Twitter, but what's like, like rich racist people? I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more than likely. Um, don't take me to court. <laughs> we're just goofing. Yeah, it's it's a parody. Yeah, we're a parody. Yeah, a parody. We love parody. Yeah, that's yeah. not slander. It's yeah. not libel. It's slapstick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a couple of funny. Yeah, we're, funny. We're just we're, we're but uh, well, the you know, crazy got, guy. Got a TikTok, YouTube, anything else? Uh, TikTok, Spotify, Kimo BF. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get approved everywhere you go with this name? I just have good luck. Yeah. I'll up a green candle and I'm set and I'm good to go. Oh. You hear that folks? Small. 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 Small dicky will be up. Yeah. Let them know. But <laughs> I think that pretty much wraps it up here for us today. 
Thank you so much for watching. Uh, follow us, Warp Taste, Warp Taste Podcast. Our Facebook got deleted. I'm going to work on that when, you know, I'll, I'm going to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> but we got an Instagram. That's the only thing we got right now. But go follow us on Instagram, Warp Taste Podcast. This has been Small Dick Emo Boyfriend. Uh, my Small Dick Emo Boyfriend. <laughs> but um, have a great day. Thank you for tuning in. You guys have a great time. Bye-bye.